Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Mango Publishing Heart Wisdom Panel. Oh, today we are talking about mindfulness for mental health. And I think I probably don't need to say a whole lot about why that is so important right now. So important. It's been such an incredibly challenging and grief filled and hard, truly hard few years for most people have gone through some form of, of hardship and trauma and loss. And so I'm really excited that we have Kim and Nita here and they'll be introducing themselves in just a moment. But first I wanted to share a couple quick quotes that I pulled from each of their books to kind of just get us thinking about this topic. And so first of all, from um, Nina's soon to be released book, Nita, when is the release date? August 9th. August 9th, but it is available for pre-order. Yes, yes, please, please. And so, and I loved, loved, loved getting to read it. So this is um, her definition in her book or a quote that she has from make every move a meditation. Mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally as if your life depended on it. And that is by John Kabat-Zinn. And that was um, the definition that Nita included at the beginning of her book. And then I also loved this from Kim's book, which is Mindfulness for Warriors. Meditation and mindfulness are coping mechanisms that can help a person learn to modulate stress and emotion for the purpose of self-regulation. They require stillness and silence. And yes, they require observation and feeling. But wait, there's more. These powerful personal practices can also empower a person to choose focus and intensity when needed and de-escalation de when desired. Can you imagine this level of self-discipline and relief? So thank you both for letting me pull a couple of quotes from your books before we got started. Just a couple of things that will sort of give us a foundation. As well, before I have Nita and Kim introduce themselves, Nita has generously offered to lead us in a short mindfulness practice. Yes, well, thank you, Sherry. Thank you so much for letting me be here and be with Kim and all of you. Um, it's always a pleasure. And what I want to share with people is a, something maybe a little bit different because often it's suggested that we close our eyes and, um, and that's great. That's a great way to do it. So I think you should keep your eyes open. So keep your eyes open. We'll start there and notice something pick something in your visual field since we're in the you know the zoomy hollywood squares here you're going to see whoever's talking um if it's me you might see the painting behind me if it's kim she's got her lovely book cover behind her um sherry of course has her book cover and then the lovely sculpture of the guy hanging over you know but pick something that speaks to you um not in a way that it has meaning necessarily but that it's just apparent so just notice that object and one of the qualities that we develop through mindfulness practice is a quality of mind called equanimity and so if you see the thing whatever that is notice in your body if there's a response maybe a positive response pleasant sensations maybe a negative response you know kind of unpleasant uh, sensations but just notice that and see if you can turn that into more of a curiosity, kind of a, oh, isn't that interesting sort of thing. And what I'd like you to do instead of me saying, okay, we're gonna do this for three minutes is throughout our program today, Ooh. just periodically, you know, listen, engage, all of that. And then periodically just bring your mind back to the visual field and back to that item, if it's apparent, if it, you know, if it's not the thing that's calling to you, then look for another thing like that. And then notice, is there any judgment around it? Is it, oh, I love that. Oh, I'm not sure about that. Oh, wah, nah, because there's always neutral also. So um, just as we're talking, as we're being here together, just periodically pay attention to your visual field in a little bit different way than what we're used to. Oh, Nita, I 
love that. Thank you for bringing us a little bit of a different mindfulness exercise. And I saw that Juliana just joined us. Can, can you just recap it in a sentence for Juliana? Pay attention to your visual field, choose something you see and notice if there's any judgment around it. And then try to relax around that so that you're more um, open to it. Again, I'm, we're practicing with the visual field and equanimity, the mind state of kind of a balanced, open, curious, accepting mind. Ah, it's not one sentence, but I don't know how else to do it. That's, a, <laughs> that's okay. And it was actually good. You know, I, I appreciated the, the extra reminder, you know, and so I also like that we're going to practice this while we're here, you know, in the, in the panel. So um, Nina, since you're, you've already just shared a little bit with us, how about if we start with you and have you introduce yourself and congratulations, you have a new book coming out. Tell us about that and whatever else you want to say about your work right now. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, Nita Sweeney. I'm the award-winning, I always like to say that, sorry, I like gold stars, um, author of uh, <laughs> several books now. The first was Depression Hates a Moving Target, How Running with My Dog Brought Me Back from the Brink, which was a running and is a running and mental health memoir. And um, then I'm also the author of a writing journal co-authored with Brendan Knight called You Should Be Writing. And then the new book, which I sort of made a mock-up here just because it's not out yet. I don't even have my author copies yet. It's so brand new, um, but it's Make Every Move a Meditation. And I just love this cover. Don't you love the colors of that cover? So I'm very excited. They did a good job. Um, so it's Make Every Move a Meditation, Mindful Movement for Mental Health, Well-Being, and Insight. And that's due out for Mango August 9th, but it's up for pre-order. Paperback and ebook are both up for pre-order and there will be an audio book, but it's not um, it's not up yet. So I'm very excited that Tantor's producing the audiobook. So, so yeah. Um, but yeah, I live in central Ohio with my uh, husband and our dog, the Paparina Scarlet. And the dog is so bad that she has her own hashtag, the 99% good dog. And because she has a hashtag, the husband also had to have a hashtag. So he's the 100% good husband. <laughs> Nina. <laughs> and Nina, before we move to have Kim introduce herself, this topic was actually your suggestion. And I just would love to hear you give us just a why. Why did you want to do this? I think that for me, let's see, the, you talked about how right now, people who don't have never had mental wellness issues are struggling. I mean, really, I don't know anybody that's not struggling with some kind of emotional turbulence and some of it bordering on mental illness. And I have lived with mental illness pretty much my entire life and have found a lot of different ways to work with that. And I've been meditating for 30 years and it's been kind of the through line. Um, when I added movement, when I added running, that changed things in an exponential way. So that was the first book was the, the running journey. But there was always been meditation. And what was interesting is I don't think I completely realized that I didn't explain that in the first book. I get these questions about, but how did you do? Well, I know now it's because I meditate. And so there's a, there's a quality of mind. There's a muscle, a mental muscle that you build through meditation practice, a type of mental stamina in addition to the physical stamina. And so um, for me, it's hard to separate mental wellness, mental health, uh, mental illness treatment from the meditative practice. It's only one of the many things I do, but it's um, it's kind of become a buzzword. And I thought this was also <clears throat> a little bit of a chance for Kim and I to talk more about the reality of how we actually practice it. And I know Kim teaches it. I teach it a little bit, but she teaches it a lot to some really people that really need it and uh, uh, gain the benefit from it. So it just seemed it just seemed important. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nita, so much. And a quick welcome to the, the folks who just joined us. We're glad to have you here. And um, Kim, let's turn it over to you. Same question. Will you share with us about your book and your work and maybe a little where your focus is right now? Sure. Uh, my book is Mindfulness for Warriors. And you can see it right behind me. <laughs> Empowering first responders to reduce stress and build resilience. I, I am a meditation teacher. Uh, 
I'm a longtime meditator. My parents actually had me trained in meditation in 1976 when I was 10 years old and I'm 56 now. So that's a lot of years. And it's, it's a tool that I used my whole entire life, but for many years, I was kind of a closet meditator because, uh, I didn't want anyone to think I was weird. It seems bizarre now to say that, but anyway, uh, it's a tool that I used my whole life. And in the early 2000s, I started to talk to people about it a little bit and share and teach people a little bit. And then in January of 2011, I quit my full-time job to teach meditation and mindfulness full-time, which at the time really wasn't a job. And, and a lot of the people around me kind of told me that, like, that's a cute idea, but <laughs> it's not a... So I just worked with private clients, taught small classes for a while, and then I started to get corporate jobs. So uh, some of my corporate clients teaching mindfulness and meditation were Garmin International, United Way, Department of Veterans Affairs, National Court Reporters Association. So I did that for quite a few years. And then uh, at a point in my life, uh, I lost my husband, who was a first responder, and I lost him to suicide. And it took me a while, actually several months to um, kind of make this turn. But I started to, to realize from my experience uh, just how traumatized and, and uh, stressed out and overwhelmed and also physically unwell a lot of first responders are because of what they endure. Yeah. And I thought, man, they need this more than anybody. So it took me a couple of years to figure out how to break through with them, but then I, I made that pivot. And now I work exclusively with first responders and veterans primarily, but also healthcare workers and social workers and some other mental health professionals. And uh, now I have a whole team that works with me and I have an online academy and we really offer wellness and resilience training type of courses and support. And the core for it always for me, I really feel like the foundation of all of it of all wellness really is meditation and mindfulness. And so that's always going to be my core topic and my favorite topic. And I, I love doing this with Nita today because, uh, because I, well, I, I read her first book and I've read, I got a sneak peek at her second book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I read that too. And I love her perspective in terms of the audience that I work with. I work with a lot of extremely traumatized people. And a lot of them are dealing with mental health issues and a ton of shame, you know, because of their professions, there's a lot of stigma around that. And I feel like Nita has a great perspective of using meditation and mindfulness and also, um, you know, how that has helped her with, with mental health, health issues. And I think that she understands that on a deeper level than, than sometimes I understand the people that mm -hmm. I work with, if that makes sense. I know, like I watched what my husband went through. So I have that perspective, but it's very, very helpful for me to be reminded that when people are dealing with anxiety, depression, and other, other mental health issues, that these skills and tools that I say are so great, and this I love, you know, are, are not always easy or accessible or doable. And um, I thought this would be a great conversation for us to have today and Nita and I to kind of play off of each other. And I always learn something from her and I always learn something that I can kind of take back to my audience, the, the, a new perspective. So anyway, it's Mindfulness for Warriors and I'm really happy to be here today and talk about this because I'm seeing people around me uh, for all different reasons, because of economic stuff, because of the political climate, all different reasons that are really struggling. And some of them kind of for the first time that they're yeah. kind of feeling depressed or yeah. 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 Oh, Kim, thank you. Thank you. And um, you've already pointed to one of the places that I want to go pretty quickly, but first I have another question for you, but I, you both talk about, uh, Kim, you talk a lot about trauma and untreated trauma and people dealing with trauma. And Nita has a, a whole chapter on practicing with pain. And I, I would like to, to start there, but first there was a conversation we had before other people joined us that I think was so important as our foundation, which is when, when both of you, and I'd love to hear from both of you, we're talking about different forms and different possibilities and how it can look and what it feels like so that 
anybody maybe hasn't hasn't had any mindfulness or meditation can can get a better understanding. Nita, do you want to start us off with that? Sure. I think it's well. I want to say if I had a nickel for everyone who said to me, I can't meditate because either I can't sit still or my mind won't, I can't still my mind, I can't make my mind empty, um, many things. I'd be a very rich woman, let's just say. But it's a, such a misconception because with meditation, there are so many ways in, so many ways to do it. I mean, the bottom line is sort of the same. You're trying to get your head where your body is. But the ways we do that are, you can't even count them. I mean, there's, you know, millions. Um, and so I think that, that part of what I try to do is come up with creative ways to sort of sneak meditation into mm. people's lives. You know, I'm like the, like a meditation dealer. We just give you a little <laughs> bit first and then you get hooked and then you want more and then you keep coming back. Yeah, anyway, yeah. So that was a bad, bad meditation. And as somebody in the recovery community, I'll probably get smacked about that, but I don't, but it's like that where once people get a taste of the benefits, I mean, and there's a, a sense of freedom. I talk a lot about in my new book about the freedom from suffering because people are suffering in large and small ways and they don't even realize it. And so I, you know, I kind of love what Kim's doing. Somebody have that she talked about how she learned some something from me, and I always learn something from her. I'm looking forward to, you know, maybe her sharing practice later. And because there's there's just so many ways to do it, and I get sad when people think, oh, this isn't for me. Um, I just want to say yet, or maybe you just haven't found. And Kim actually said this earlier: the right teacher, the right technique. I mean, I'm practically quoting her, the right teacher, the right technique, the right practice, the right discipline. Uh, there's just so many ways. And so in some ways, um, the the new book that I'm coming out with is, is my attempt to do that because people are really into exercise and fitness. And we know so many benefits of that. And the benefits overlap with meditation. It's the studies show the same benefits. And so if you're already doing Zumba, pickleball, jujitsu, playing tennis. Um, if you're in physical therapy, why not meditate while you're doing all those things? Yes. That's the, that's the, the pitch for the new book is, is it sort of a, an efficiency argument? Although, you know, the, there's always good news, bad news with Nita. The good news is there's all these benefits and you can do it anytime. And the bad news is it's still work. There is still effort that has to be done right effort but it can be these tiny little doses. And so that's what I, I just wanna open up the world to seeing that there's a lot of ways to do this and so many misconceptions um, about it. Ah, love that, Nita. And before I turn it over, cause I'd like to hear from you, Kim, I wanna remind people and a couple of people joined us a little late. Nita had introduced us to a practice um, not so much a moving uh, mindfulness practice, but a while you're on our Zoom call practice that needed one sentence, just explain it to us again so that people who just joined. Notice something in your visual field, whether it's on this Zoom call or even in the room you're in, just one thing, one particular thing, and then notice if you have a judgment about it and where you feel that in your body. And then just let that go and come back to us. <laughs> and then periodically, right? If it catches your eye or it catches your attention, check in again. It's just kind of a, we've got a, a practice a visual, going on. Right, using that as, it's called an object of meditation. And meditation, often you have something you're pointing your mind toward and they call that an object of meditation. And so the visual field is one of the options of ways you can meditate. Thank you, Nita. Like I'm Thank using uh, Sherry's little statue there. Oh, I'm using Karen's lights. Yeah. Oh, me too. <laughs> oh, I know. Aren't they pretty? Well, yeah. I'm trying not to have any judgment, good or bad. No, actually, you can have judgment. Oh, I can? Just notice it. Oh, that's all. It's not, Thank you, Mia. No, it's not about being wrong or being, yeah. No, no. Just notice. It's worth it, right. you know? And I feel the pleasant sensations in my body when I, when she first hopped on, I was like, oh, wow. I just feel it. 
Love it. Okay, so Kim, same question to you, because this was, again, like what we were talking about before we actually went live, which is all of this idea about what it is and I can't do it. What do you have to yeah, say about that? Yeah, yeah. So I meet so many people who think they can't do it or will say, I've tried that. It's not for me because of what they think meditation is. So they think it means stopping their thoughts, uh, turning off their thoughts, quieting their mind, things like that. And so uh, I just try to get people to understand there are many, many different approaches. There's no, there's no one right way to meditate. No one owns it. And, um, and a little bit different from Nita is that I've never taught moving meditations and that's not been a part of my work. I, I use mindfulness when I'm maybe walking my dog, for example, if I've been really up in my head, maybe working a lot. So I'll leave my phone behind. I won't listen to a podcast or whatever, walk my dog and bring mindfulness to that by doing something similar to what Nita's talking about, which would be noticing the sun on my skin, just noticing it, not, not judging it, not just noticing it, uh, you know, paying attention to my dog in front of me, noticing if there's a breeze or not, just being present, finding something to anchor myself into that moment. So I do that. And I have a lot of people in the demographic that I work with ask me, uh, do I have to sit to meditate? Can I, can I move? And I say, to me, a moving meditation, like if you're a cyclist or a, a gardener, that's one form of meditation or a mindful practice. And I really encourage people to also consider a sit every day, some kind of a sit every day. I feel like that is the only way that we can uh, completely disengage from thinking. You know, even if you're out walking, you have to pay attention to what you're doing and don't trip and don't, you know, um, it's, but what I do is I try and remove the obstacles and the roadblocks and uh, whatever would prevent someone from sitting still. Now, I always qualify this by saying, if you can't sit still in a chair and take a breath or two and be with self, then meditation is probably not your next logical step. It is probably time for you to question why and maybe make that first appointment with a counselor or a therapist or a trusted yeah. friend. And because if you cannot sit still with self and just breathe, there's, there's something that's preventing you from doing that. And that's where you start. So I don't ever, I don't want anyone to think that I believe meditation is the end all be all and it's the panacea and it's going to fix everything because some people are just not quite there yet. And Nita, maybe you can speak to that a little bit in your experience of, um, for example, I, you know, when I'm working with people who are struggling with anxiety and depression, and it really is a struggle for them to sit with themselves, period. Like that's just the way they explain it to me. But what I'm trying to do in my instruction, and I told you guys before we started to record that I have a free 21 day meditation jumpstart program that I just, it's absolutely free. And I'm offering that to give people a few different ways in and some, and I just say, try all of these. It's just experiment, start to see what works for you. We're all different. We all have different learning styles. And, and if you can find something that feels pretty good, that helps you uh, sort of get into almost like a daydreamy state where you, you feel yourself relaxing. But if you can only do it for a minute or two, you feel that and it feels good, but there's no way you can sit for 20 minutes or 15. That's just where you are right now. Then I say, you know, be your own guru. Say, well, I can do this probably for two minutes a day and do that for a while. Do that for a while. That can be your gateway. You know, that can be your way in. Um, so I'm very much in agreement with Nita about giving people a lot of different tricks, tips, tools, and different ways in so that they can discover for themselves what meditation is really about and what all the hype is. <laughs> but, but I'm not encouraging anybody to push against anyone's instruction or technique or discipline, not to, it can, it's a little uncomfortable. Sometimes you can push through reasonably, like I'm bored. I don't feel like sitting here. Okay. You can push through that, but I feel a panic attack coming on. Okay. I'm not going to ask you to, to push through that. If, if that makes sense. Yeah, Kim, thank you. And I just wanted to throw in, and I know a lot of people know this about me because I, I speak about it often, but my 
um, way into meditation was through depression and anxiety. And I did uh, start sitting in complete stillness and it was not easy, right? But as I was telling uh, Nita and Kim before we started, um, no matter how difficult it ever was and no matter how much grief might come up or anxiety while I was sitting, I look back and it's like hands down saved my life, you know, and I, and I, I think it's because partly I was running so much from accepting myself, right? There was so much self-hate. There was so much self-talk and loathing that I was believing until I started to meditate and, and be able to understand what was coming from, you know, truth in my heart and authentic self versus you know, whatever you call monkey mind, the devil, whatever you want to call it. So, you know, and again, not to say like, oh, that's the way, but also as we were talking about before we started, it is hard or it can be hard. Maybe it's not for everyone, um, but wow, no matter what you choose and where you choose to start, it is worth it. I, I too am a 30 year meditator now and I'd be dead without it. I don't, I don't have any doubt about that. So, um, Nita, did you want to add anything? Yes, yes, I did address that in the new book. There's a, I think it's a section, not a whole chapter called, is this as powerful as sitting? Mm. And um, because I'm an Enneagram nine who hates conflict, the answer is, of course, it depends. And, but I think that um, what, what I have found is that sitting completely still creates the best conditions for the mind to calm. Ah. But that physical stillness of the body is the most powerful way to allow the mind to calm, not to make it calm, but to, to create conditions for it to calm. And so in, I'm not, you know, I've been, I do sitting practice have been done, have been doing sitting practice from many years also. And, but we also did walking practice Yes. When we did sitting practice always too. So it was, I sort of learned them at the same time. And so it feels like they, there's so much overlap, but I will say, I mean, Kim's right that if, if there's something in me that's keeping me from just being able to be physically still for even the shortest period of time, that's something else I need to look at. And it's going to make um, the focus component of mindfulness practice difficult because that, I mean, you're stripping everything away when you're just being completely still, there's nothing between you and everything. And so <laughs> sometimes that's too terrifying. And I also talk, um, there's a little bit about trauma and trauma treatment, um, in meditation because there is a whole, um, set of trauma informed meditation teachers now because that's become apparent that it's necessary and so uh so yeah it's something to pay attention to but i think it's i, I just think it's um another way in and my bottom line with that chapter is well why not do both <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's how i was like and why not do it for sure i totally agree do, do both yeah yeah, I was, I was going to say the same thing. And again, I'm back to, you know, I love Kim's suggestion. And I always suggest to people start with a minute if the, with the stillness, you know, and I, I'm a huge fan of uh, dancing, you know, the five rhythms, moving meditation, which is sort of another official moving meditation. But yeah, to try, like you're saying, try, try everything, try anything. Um, and I, and I want to, to go back to what I had said a few minutes ago about that, that both of you do address trauma, you address pain. We, we've already said, and we all know that a lot of people might be coming to mindfulness in a place of pain, you know? And so can we talk about that for a minute? Like what, yeah, what would you each like to say about that? Like I'm in pain, I'm coming to meditation. And it seems to me, at least this was my experience, holy cow, it felt like it was a hundred times worse at first because I was noticing it. So I'd love to hear you guys say more about that. Um, I'm happy to start. The, the way that I learned to think about, uh, okay, so there's sort of 
two types of pain. There's physical pain, and then there's emotional or mental chatter pain, and and there there's a lot of overlap. the The way I learned to work with pain first, because um, if if I didn't have the skills, you know, meditation is like it's sort of like lifting weights. You're building a muscle, a muscle of focus, a muscle of equanimity, a, you know, these mind states, and and I didn't have the skill set to deal head on with the emotional stuff. And so my teacher suggested working with your foot falling asleep because, or actually he said, start with your nose itching, you know, something real simple, something that you are pretty sure won't kill you. Even the foot falling asleep, some people were convinced that would be permanent damage, but the nose itching, you're pretty sure it's not you know, bone cancer, which is unlike the foot, um, which that's where my mind goes. Um, but uh, so to just notice what an itching nose feels like without scratching it, which seemed absurd. I mean, ridiculous. Why would you not scratch your nose? So it's, it's a little experiment in what an itching nose feels like. And he said that um, when we get into emotional pain, which I'll, I'll just go, you know, you start with that. Okay. Now my nose, of course, Gary, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and you, and you feel free to itch it, but choose, <laughs> choose to itch it, choose to scratch it as opposed to the, just that automatic. And that's, that's what we usually do. We just automatically try to relieve ourselves of the pain. And so, so he said, so that's kind of how you work with the um, you know, what does an itching nose feel like? And can I be equanimous with an itching nose? Can I let it be and notice? Because usually what happens is it may still itch, but you notice that there's movement within the itch or there's a coming and going, that it's not a constant itch. There's a, you know, a motion within the itch, but you have to sit to notice that and you have to let it itch, not scratch it. So when it comes to emotions, it's the same kind of observation, but what the way he explained it that um, is that uh, that thoughts and um, body sensations, especially with emotions, are they're like red. One is red and one is white thread, and they're so bound up together and all tied up together that from a distance they look pink. And so the practice is to notice which one is red and which one is white and just to sort of gradually be able to see the difference and that that awareness helps foster the equanimity to be with it. But again, it's a skill set that you're not going to just be able to do it, but you can start with your nose because there's the body sensations of the it. And then there's the thought of, oh my God, I've got to scratch this. This is ridiculous. What is she saying? Who are these people? Why am I here? What day is it? Where's my coffee? What's on my grocery? I mean, it's just, that's where our heads go. And so, um, and so that the gently bringing it back to, oh, the body sensation of actually what a nose feels like, or, oh, those are the thoughts and separating that out and realizing that often the thoughts are sort of an extra layer on top of the actual experience, which is yeah. itchy nose. So that's kind of the, that's sort of the, the longest short answer of how I deal with pain, whether it's physical or emotional is separating it out and figuring out what is the, you know, it's not even figuring out, it's learning to be with the actual physical sensation. Where is it my body? What, you know, is it soft, cold, hard, hot? What, what does it feel like? And then letting it do its little dance because often things kind of rise up and then they sort of have a little motion they do and then they pass away <laughs> and then they rise up again, you know, like that. And, um, and then also noticing, are those thoughts coming? Um, are they from the past? Are they, am I in the future? Are they right now? And are they a judgment that's adding extra heat to something that's actually a very simple sensation? So wow. It out. It's like, it's, it sounds much more complex, but when you're sitting, you just sit there and then you just notice whatever the sensation is. And then you notice, oh, my mind is making this whole story about it. And then, you know, you very gently bring very gently key, 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 very gently bring the mind back to what's my nose actually feel like. Mm. Oh, Nita. Oh, that was superb. Yes. And before I have Kim, I do want to hear from you, Kim. I just wanted to say, because my experience, 
that happened just naturally, right? It wasn't forced. I didn't try to make this happen. But what was so life-saving for me is when I was in that deep depression, it felt solid. Like I would have told anybody, I'm always depressed. I've always been depressed. This is who I am. It's like an iron wall closing in. And I very clearly remember the meditation where I took an in-breath and I thought, I don't want to kill myself. Like there was a moment like where I really, like it wasn't there. And that changed everything, right? Because it was like that story of this is solid. This is who I am. I'm always going to be this. It was, it, I could never believe it again. So it's, it's just a perfect um, example of what you were talking about. I'm really yeah. glad you had that experience. I mean, thank you. I'm so glad you're here. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. Me too. Me too. Oh, thank you. Yeah, me too. And you know, it's it's it was meditation. I, I don't know if I would have seen it otherwise. But Kim, well, what, yes. Oh, so what ahead. occurred to me, yeah, was so that kind of connects in with with what Nita was saying and the nose itch, and then what you were just saying is as she was describing that nose itch and Karen, fair enough that to me too, I was like, Ooh, does my nose actually kind of itch right now? <laughs> because she suggested it. But, um, I, I work with, a, a, with people who carry a heavy mental and emotional load and sometimes sitting still and closing the eyes, they have images, visions, memories. Um, there's guilt, there's shame. There's a lot of, you know, so what I notice in, in amongst these people is that they tend to keep themselves uh, distracted or sedated. So distracted, busy, 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 go, 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 always doing something or drink or something that, you know, like that uh, because they're so afraid to sit and for the nose to itch, meaning for the emotions to rise, for the uh, intrusive thoughts to begin. And so when your nose itches, intensely and you if you were doing this exercise and your nose inches itches intensely and you really just want to scratch it but also you want to play around with mindfulness just for a second or two or experiment you you realize you can hold off you can itch it in a second no harm really is going to come to you it might be a little uncomfortable also your nose is not going to itch like this forever and ever and ever and so I try to convey that to people as well. When the thoughts come up, the memories, the, the images, the visions, especially the, the self-loathing ones, the, the, the ones directed at you, to be able to discern, to be able to realize that these are thoughts, they're not real, and they're not even true. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are true, if they're hurting you or that then there are things you can do about that. There are people trained to help you talk about them, feel them, process them, you know, whatever, whatever you need to do to work through, through those. But I know from working with so many people that especially with depression, they feel like their nose is just, they don't remember a time when their nose didn't itch and their nose is just always going to itch. So what's the point? They're just always depressed. The only time they feel at all human is when they're super busy because they don't, you know, or drunk out of their mind or whatever it is for each individual that they can escape that for a little bit. So explaining as Nita was to people, the importance of just experimenting and understanding the difference between you and the thoughts, you and the feeling, and that there is a little space in there those thoughts are not who you are and the emotions are not, they're your emotions, but they don't, they aren't who you are. And just getting people to want to slow down enough to experiment with that and, and understand it is that's a, that's difficult. That's kind of a big hump to get over. Yeah. Yeah. How do you do it, Kim? So, I mean, I know that that's a lot of what your work, right? I mean, you're often helping people get over that. How do you, how do you do it? Well, like I said earlier, uh, and maybe I said it, I guess I said it before we were recording, but uh, just by encouraging people, offering them so many different approaches and to start to notice if something isn't, if, if they're about to bounce out of it because they're feeling something or just to become aware and maybe try a little different approach, you know, try like, here's four different techniques. You try all four of those. And then if you start to feel that overwhelming feeling and you don't, you, you feel like you can't sit still, maybe 
shift into one of these other techniques, see if that helps. And also starting with short amounts of time, not putting so much pressure. I work with a lot of veterans and first responders. So it's a lot of type A personalities, go-getters, doers, you know, they're fixers, they're savers, they're rescuers, they're, I mean, they set a goal, they achieve the goal. That, a lot of the people I work with, um, that's how they approach life. It makes them really good at their job, but it can make them really bad at meditation because they think that they want to do it right. And um, they want to stay within the parameters and they want to check boxes and, and all that stuff. So I'm trying to teach them to relax and allow. So what I say to, to this group a lot is this is not an outcome you can force. You're used to forcing outcomes. This is about allowing. This is about sitting and being. And I really work hard to get people to understand at, at a depth the difference between being and doing and what it means to just to be and to sit in a chair and just endeavor to experiment with what does being even mean, you're on your way to being. Hmm. So I try to spend a lot of time just, you know, what, what you're going to try and do here is train yourself to sit and breathe and just be because all of the benefits that are available to us occur naturally. The body knows what to do, the brain, the body chemistry, but it happens in the allowing. We, we can't force the outcome. And, and that's tricky too. So I just, I start slow. I give them a lot of um, like chicken exits, you know, like if this doesn't work, try this, go this way. And, and I, I, I remove the, um, uh, I remove any time frame pressure, you know, yeah. start with one minute and then you decide the day that you can add one minute. Now you have a two minute meditation practice. Yes, research says, that we need to sit in that like 10 ish to 20 ish minute window or so. Uh, but let's don't worry about that right now. <laughs> let's just train our brain and body to allow us to sit and, and be, and I never ask anybody to push through the really, really bad stuff. I want to be really clear about that for anyone who might listen to this later, who is struggling with mental health issues. Uh, I would never suggest you push through and sit through. Yeah. A, a, a mental or emotional crisis moment. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. You know, opposite of what we're trying to accomplish here. Yeah. Kim, thank you. And especially use the word allow uh, several times. And I just think that's so important. You know, I just wrote it down because I loved it. You know, this is not an outcome you can force. And, you know, I think in a culture where so many of us were just brought up, push through, force it, get to that goal no matter what. That's what the outcome is the most important. Here we're talking about the process and, and the being process. And it's like such a, ooh, you know, it's such a, a new way of thinking for, I know as for me and for many of us, especially in, you know, this Western culture. Nita, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to speak to that a little bit. I was really surprised when I was doing the research for Make Every Move a Meditation, I pulled some sports performance books to see if there was anything about that and book after book after book had some little mention or sometimes a whole thread all the way through of how performance enhancing mindfulness is so actually huh. it's efficient because that forcing uses extra energy that we don't need to use to take the action, to get the outcome. So all of that forcing, which our culture has trained us is the right way, is, is can be counterproductive. I mean, for some people, it, they have to do that to get started. And that, especially when you're depressed, sometimes it feels as if you have to force yourself to do things. It's just not, you know, there is no flow. But learning that mind skill of being, I love the word allowing. Thank you, Kim. That was just that I really needed that today too. Of allowing what is and not adding sort of that extra layer of pressure, drama, whatever it is, we can come to whatever situation we actually have to do with more energy. And so it's it's actually kind of a shortcut. And so sometimes the people, I, I, um, I'm a runner and a lot of the people that I end up talking to about this are 
you know, they're, they're ultra marathoners. They're trying to qualify for Boston. They're, you know, high, very type A, very, very, very type A people. And so when I talk about it being efficient, mm -hmm. they, I always get these really quizzical looks, but if you explain that they're adding this extra layer that doesn't need to be added, then people start to get it and they have to experience it to really get it. But, uh, but I can see it's just our, our culture is just, you know, pound, 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 do, 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 go, go, go. And so it seems like yeah. the opposite of what we would, what we yeah. would want. Yeah. I wanted to see if anybody had anything you wanted to say or a question. Okay, well, feel free if you do, you know, you can put it in the chat or you could just raise your hand or whatever. Um, I also want to check in. I know Kim is going to, um, in about five minutes, Kim is going to do another, we're going to have another mindfulness exercise. But um, Kim or Nita, I know you both had brought things to read. I don't know if they still feel like, oh, this is the right time. Or if you have another topic that feels more pressing, I'm going to sort of see what, what feels right to each of you. I'm really loving this conversation about mindfulness and mental health because I feel that a lot of people who are struggling with mental health issues feel like meditation is off the table for them or that mindfulness. So I like that we're having this conversation and kind of coming at it from a few different angles. And a couple of things that Nita said uh, reminded me, like talking about um, it being efficient. Uh, I encounter a lot of people who worry that they'll lose their edge because their whole job is based on the, their sharp edge. And so being able to explain to them that not only will you not lose your edge, once you really understand meditation practice that it becomes you know, integrated into your life, that it actually provides or offers mental clarity. This the mental clarity that's so crucial for these people on the job, whether they're fighting a fire, they're uh, an, an emergency medical tech, uh, a police officer, uh, when they get mentally flooded, overwhelmed, stressed, and mentally flooded, and the breathing stops, or they hold their breath, or the breathing gets labored, mental clarity can go out the window. And, and that's when we make mistakes, right? When we're, we don't continue to breathe, and um, when we're mentally flooded. So being able to explain to them, because a lot of them are dealing with anxiety and depression, you know, on top of the pressure of their job. So understanding when you're dealing with mental health issues, that practicing meditation regularly is sort of like going to the gym regularly in that that improves your physical fitness and your endurance. No one's going to argue with that. Practicing meditation regularly as an exercise restructures and rewires your brain can to the degree that when you have that moment of crisis. So, I mean, I, I suppose the same thing would apply to a distance runner, Nita, when you have that, that moment where you need all your mental faculties, or you need the ability to mentally push through this piece or make the right decision or the right choice right now, that because you've trained your brain, for example, for first responders, they develop the ability to shift their thinking from that amygdala stress response into the prefrontal cortex and that executive functioning. So the ability to make, to problem solve and make better decisions. And that happens as a result of the discipline of meditation. So there are so many facets to talk about. And even if you're someone who is struggling or dealing with mental health issues, um, it's not just about sitting and being chill, you know, and yeah. it's not just, I mean, that's, that's an aspect of it. It can calm the anxiety. It can, you know, and it can, it help you feel relaxed, but there are so many other physiological benefits that help improve your life and your relationships and your job and your productivity. And, you know, so many, so many aspects. So I thought about that when you were talking about the type A runners need a, yeah. Yes. Yeah, there's even a study that says, well, there's two different studies. One that says it, it can help you um, generate new brain cells, which who knew? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then also the, uh, was it the telomeres? So life, like longevity is dependent on these things called telomeres. Yeah. And it actually can extend the <gasps> telomeres. I mean, so there's, there's, 
Wow. It's not about, I, I, I love talking about, you know, what do you think about meditation? Is it the Instagram influ influencer on the beach? Is it the monk in the orange robes? Or is it some, you know, middle-aged lady in central Ohio staring at her window at her dog? I mean, it's just anything. Um, and, or is it some firefighter running into a fire? Right. And yes, it can be, it can be any of that. So thank you, Kim, for talking about the executive function too, and uh, giving us the brain parts, because it's, it's really quite amazing technology. It's a tool. Uh, it's not the woo-woo thing. It's, I mean, it can be woo-woo, you know, it's all that too, but it, it is a technology that can help people live better lives and, you know, be better at everything. And we just can't argue with the science anymore. No, it's the science yeah. is crazy yeah. valid. I mean, the study after study after study. I love, uh, Nita, when you were just listing some of those benefits, one of my favorites that I heard, uh, Rick Hansen, who is the author of Buddha Brain, Buddha's Brain, he, I once heard him speak and he said, also, when we meditate, we're not just changing our own brains, but that we're impacting generations to come. Mm -hmm. And I loved that it made me suddenly feel like, oh, this isn't just, not that it's not enough. Of course, it's enough just for my own, you know, mental health. But I like the idea of it actually impacting future generations that, you know, we're passing on new brains, you know, and new chemistry to people. That was, that was a great little benefit. Yeah. Healing some of the generational trauma that, yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. 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 Yep. Hey, I can't believe it's gotten so late so quickly and oh my gosh, I feel like we could go for hours on there's so many aspects of this and you two are stuck. I just love everything you've brought to it. But I did want to get, as I was saying to you guys before we went live, I love the practical aspects and being able to offer people just these little bit of practical moments. So Kim, um, are you willing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll give you one very, very simple, very practical uh, breathing exercise. That's a mindful breathing exercise that you can use anytime, any place. And I like to teach people simple breathing exercises because if you're on the go or at a point of crisis, uh, you know, you start to feel off mentally, emotionally, whatever it is um, that you have an, a go-to. So I like, for me, I like to use my breath as an anchor. So mm -hmm. I, you know, you think about dropping an anchor in the water that stops you, you know, so that's that pause that you need for, for a moment of mindfulness. And then the anchor will hold you there till you pull the anchor up, you know? So I like to think of the breath like that. So I thought we could do, um, I've been working a lot in the past few months and talking more about the extended exhale breathing. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of science around the extended exhale breathing that says when you inhale fully and you extend your, the exhale, it's a little longer than the inhale uh, for just two minutes one minute you'll feel, you'll start to feel something for just two minutes that begins to turn off your stress response. So it turns, it dials down the stress response and it engages the parasympathetic nervous system or that rest and digest. So this is a, a tool you can use. It's just your breath and science tells us it can help, uh, cool off your stress response. So when you feel overwhelmed, stressed out, anxious, you're stuck in traffic, you're very angry or upset about something. And, you know, the thoughts want to start going crazy and you start to feel whatever it is you feel or with anxiety. If you can just remember to do this and, and here's a good way to remember or to um, practice it. So you can inhale and mentally count to four. And as you exhale, mentally count to six. And you just repeat that over and over. It's a mindful practice because when you are paying attention to your breathing and observing your breathing, you're just, you're, you're in the moment. You can't do that in 50 other things. You're present, you're present in this moment and you're present with self. And that's really important. So let's just do like two or three rounds of extended exhale breathing. So I'll start us off by counting once, then I'm gonna be quiet so you can count at your own pace because we all breathe differently. And I don't wanna stress you out with a breathing exercise. All right, so eyes open, eyes close, whatever feels most comfortable for you. So we inhale, two, three, four, and we exhale, two, three, four, 
five, six, right into the next inhale. I'll let you mentally count yourself. The important thing to remember about this is to breathe at your own pace, your own cadence, match your counting to your own breathing. And if this doesn't feel good to you or doesn't feel right, then maybe this isn't for you. But that extended exhale breathing is a tool we can use to literally calm and quiet our own physiology. And it brings you into the moment, brings you into the present moment and present with self. And that's a mindful practice. Oh, Kim, I loved that. I hope, uh, you know, I hope other people really enjoyed practicing it. Thank you for bringing us that. And same for Nita. Nita, maybe we better circle back to yours too before we close out. Uh, just the same thing, just noticing what's in the visual field, choosing one thing and noticing any body sensations or thoughts that arise and whether they're pleasant, unpleasant or neutral and just being with them. No need to change them. Just notice exactly what is in the moment. Mm. And ah. thank you, Kim, that was lovely. I, that's a very powerful, very powerful mindfulness practice. Thank you so much. And I really, both both Kim and Nita, I, I so appreciate everything that you brought and more importantly, everything you are. I just feel like you both have been such beautiful role models and brought so much um, practical as well as just, you know, thought provoking things around mindfulness. So thank you. And thank, thank you, you. for watching. Thanks, Sherry, for these panels that all the guests that come in. Thank you. Thank to Mango. Lots of yeah. things around. Really helpful. And it's great to see everybody. And Sherry, you are the hostess with the mostest. You always do such a great job. You do. You do a great job. Need it. Always good to see you. Always good to Thanks, see you. Thanks, everybody. Loretta, Juliana, thank you for being with us. And um, thank you, Shelby. Yeah, thank you, Shelby. We'll see you all, hopefully, at an upcoming Wednesday Heart Wisdom panel. Mwah. Thanks. Bye. Bye.